We are live. Fantastic, and thank you, Martha. Welcome, everybody, to Hash Sales EU. Uh, this is one of our special sessions where, in fact, we've got one of our Pipeline and CRM partners from Austria actually going to talk to us today. And you're going to talk to us about uh, working smarter and about how you can save money, etc., by making good decisions effectively. Is that correct, Chris? That, that's correct, yes, definitely. And uh, we're going to tie that together from the CEO all the way down to the first line salespeople. Ah, fantastic news. That's great. Okay, so your Twitter tag is at leader for sales. That's leader number four sales. So if anybody would like to reach out to you on Twitter, that's how to do it. Now, what's the company you work for and what is your website? Okay, it's Visionaires Partner and the website is V-I-S-I-O-N-E-E-R-S, P-A-R-T-N-E-R, -E -E like partner, uh, one word, dot com. Fantastic. Visionaires Partners, partner dot com. <laughs> That's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Now, okay, before we get into the questions, let's hear a little bit about yourself. So you're in Austria, but you don't have an Austrian accent. So what's going on with that? That's right. Uh, I'm in Austria. I've been here five years now, but I first came to Austria about uh, 15 years ago uh, for part of uh, my studies, my MBA, a joint program from the States where I'm originally from. And uh, while I was over here studying, I did the uh, typical thing and fell in love with an Austrian woman. <laughs> Fantastic. Has so. to be done, I hear. <laughs> yes, definitely. Brilliant. Okay, so let's dive into some of the questions. So our first question that we have today is, how can a business be smart with allocating resources to aid growth? So this is all I'm guessing about, um, you know, making smart decisions to 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 aid the growth pattern within your organization, which is, I think, challenging for most people. So what, what's your take on that? I think it's very challenging, and unfortunately, it's because people are thinking about the quota of the week, month, or quarter. And the uh, ability to think long term just isn't there anymore when it comes especially to the sales organization. Everyone's chasing the, uh, the euro, the dollar, the one, whatever currency that their goal quota is in, and they're going after that and not thinking about long term. So uh, to me, really, it takes a couple things. It takes the long term thinking, and to produce sustainability and ROI, you really have to bridge together the organization. And this really is talking about strategy, sales, CRM, anything else that uh, works within the sales organization and the sales organization touches. They are not standalone uh, topics. They aren't things that you can make a decision on one day and then forget about and move on to the next topic. These all need to be bridged together. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And I think in sales, the, the unfortunate reality is that leadership within the sales team always pushes for short-termism. So it's always about this month or this quarter. The old adage in sales, certainly in the UK, is you're only as good as your last month. So exactly. there is no long-term outlook in that sort of thinking. Um, now, you can say, though, that a, success, a good strategy is, is a succession of short-term goals, which are executed well so you know there are exactly. two sides to that coin if it's strung together well uh, but you're right it is there is a great deal of short-term thinking how can we how can we get out of this mindset how do you break that silo and work across the organization I mean particularly for sales because we're supposed to be consultative <laughs> as well uh, exactly and if there's anybody that should be able to work across an organization it's salespeople who sometimes they're selling to purchasers sometimes to the financial decision makers sometimes to the manufacturing uh, plant manager so it should be the salespeople that can do this and unfortunately we have um, wanted to be left alone and not get into the corporate politics uh, probably for too long so I really think there's five areas that companies need to basically start looking at. And first is the strategy and the processes. They have to be tied together. Uh, Frank Cepedis, a Harvard professor, just wrote a book on aligning sales strategy to company strategy. And uh, the results, the percentage of salespeople who even have a clue of what company strategies are is, is below 25%. Oh, so, and it's not just on the salespeople. They uh, actually had another part in there where they took uh, C level, ten C level, and company training, and asked them, "What are your five corporate strategies?" And the average answer out of that group of ten, so ten C level people, five corporate strategies, possibility of between five and fifty. The average answer was a somewhere in the neighborhood of 30, I think it was 28 off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So even the C-level is not aligned on what the main goals of the company are. 
So you've got to do that, and then you've got to tie those to the processes throughout the organization, both vertically and horizontally. And if you can do that on the science side or the technical side and develop a culture that's a leadership coaching and development culture where people are working to fulfill these strategies and making smart decisions based on those, then you're going to put in place things that your company needs to fulfill these strategies. And that takes me to the next one, which is information systems, or specifically sales information systems. Right? Unfortunately, if you ask, you know, where's the biggest waste of money in companies, it's either sales training or CRM. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So if you can align those to the strategies through the right processes with the right culture, then you're going to save uh, a lot of headaches there and a lot of grumbling of your salespeople. And finally, tie it all in with continuous development that's put in the direction to work with those information systems within the culture of the company, within the processes set up to fulfill the strategy. Mm. I think you're in touch. You're, there's, a, there's a great deal in what you said there. I think, um, obviously, I'm, I'm a CRM expert, so that's what I can relate to and talk about as well as sales, or the sales right. aspects of that. Um, what I found traditionally with a sales team which is implementing a CRM system is, of course, they offload responsibility for it to the IT team. Yes. And, of yeah. course, what that is is... The well-known statistic in CRM is 70% of all, all implementations fail. So if you look exactly. at it from that point of view, quite often the sales director is backing off and, or VP of sales and saying, you know what, I won't deal with that political fallout if it fails. I'll just give it to IT because they've got to do it. And as you said, if sales are withdrawing from the whole politics element, then it doesn't, doesn't help them to actually achieve the goals or to yeah. help uh, develop and direct strategy within their own organization. Exactly, and in fact, every single strategic decision should be made with sales in mind because every single strategic decision or strategy that's set by a company has an impact on sales. So let's look at that. Okay. Is it the sales which impact the strategy or the strategy which impacts the sales? We've got Mick Adam who's actually turned around and asked that very question. What does come first? You know, whole chicken and the egg, so it's <laughs> obviously being slightly controversial. Yeah. Uh, is it the sales or the strategy which needs to come first? Because in most organizations, you know, revenue cures all ills. You know? um, yes, revenue cures all ills, but usually if it's not tied together, the revenue is a short-term result, and eventually it's going to catch up to you. So to me, the strategy comes first because every company has a culture. You can have two competing companies in the exact same industry with totally different cultures that have different sales processes that need different uh, sales information tools, different processes, because they have different cultures, because they are different, and their strategy is going to be lined up for that. And if you have salespeople that can't follow a strategy, then every sales team is going to go out and do things their way. And yeah. that could be okay for a while, but eventually it's going to catch up to you. So strategy has got to come first. Yeah, um, I would agree with that. And if you look at the sales process in particular, uh, there are well-documented accounts where uh, having a sales process which is rigorously followed by the sales <laughs> team, sales individuals, will lead to greater and greater revenue. And those companies which do that are 27% more successful than those that don't. So exactly. th there, is, there is hard data behind it as well to support that, that logical Definitely. argument. Yeah. Good. Okay, so... Uh, I often see, though, uh, within organ, because I go, the nature of my role is I tend to talk to a lot of organizations, both large and small, and I see a lot of wastage. I see a lot of mistakes being made because of inexperience, because a lack of will to enforce, a lack of leadership in many situations. Right. So they turn around and chase the revenue, and they are successful organizations. Uh -huh. So just because they're wasteful, doesn't mean to say they're not going to be successful. So does it really matter that much if they're not following it? Yes, you could be more successful, but as long as you are being successful, what does it matter? Well, I think part of it is you still have to start to define what is success. And if you really define success by simply revenue generation and meeting goals, uh, everyone on here knows the, the studies that uh, 50 to 60% of sales rep make go quota. That's it. So that means half the salespeople are not making quota. That means they're not reaching their goals. So that means they're not being successful. When we really look at it um, in, in the changing that companies are starting to go through of revenue generated goals versus gross margin or profit generated goals, and you look at the average profit of the global 10,000, and um, you, know, you realize that that's 
hovering in the low single digits, then if you know three or four percent profit at the end of the day is good. Imagine what it would be if you didn't give that extra five percent discount. I think that's correct, <laughs> and I think it's um, yeah. I'm being successful because I've done a hundred million. Yeah. Well, what happened to the other four hundred million I could have made, and then you could be absolutely astonishingly good, and then you could be up in the true billionaire status. Yeah. Exactly, and, and a friend of mine actually just told me uh, a story last week where somebody was out there selling to uh, a customer, and the customer kept buying and buying and buying, and the manager just said, "So, at what point did the customer say no?" Mm. <laughs> and the sales rep said, "Well, he never did. He was happy. And how do you know he was done buying?" Is what the sales manager said. So there was probably <laughs> money left on the table. Absolutely, and I have to say, in sales, I see that all the time. Money being left on the on the table, particularly in the CRM yeah. game, where uh, you quite often get a, a lack of implementation services sold with the application. Because of course, quite often mm -hmm. it comes down to price and its value proposition. Then, which you've got to t turn around and uh, explain to people why they do need help. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, let's move on to question two. Which components are required to achieve success in sales today? Uh, well, the, the different components, I, I actually I kind of mentioned them earlier where I talked about the strategy and the processes uh, and then the culture of the company, uh, the sales information systems, and also in the bottom, continuous development. So I, I would say that these, these are the components, and um, the companies need to make sure that they align and they connect and bridge together. And if you look on the surface as, as these five and dig deeper, I think you'll, you're going to be aligned for success in the long term and not just today. Absolutely. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. Half of all salespeople, though, still don't make quota. Yeah. So what's going on with that? It's a number of things. Uh, some of it is just the fact that there's too many sales positions out there for qualified salespeople. Too many right. positions out there. Too many, too many positions, and thank God there are for us, right? But uh, <laughs> if you look at the number of positions for the number of really qualified salespeople and people who have been properly trained in sales, there are not enough qualified salespeople out there. That's that's pretty much a given. And um, so I, I think that's one area where there's definitely an opportunity for companies to try to find better qualified people and uh, the, the profession of sales, those of us that uh, love sales as a profession, I think we're trying to start to do something about that, but uh, I think yep. that's definitely one factor that that's, needs to be addressed. Yeah, I think you're right, but uh, and that's one of the reasons why of course we started Hash Sales EU. Yep. But the, the world in which people are working now has changed dramatically. It's no longer, certainly no longer in my generation, a jobs for life. My parents' generation had that. And my son's generation mm -hmm. it is likely to be <laughs> completely about freelance economy, effectively. Uh, and in fact, if you look at some of the TED Talks which currently take place, they're all about uh, on-demand resources, which is in, translated to employment terms as you get contractors in and when you need them to do the skill sets that when and need you you need them. So they're sure. all specialist hires for a contracted period of time mm -hmm. rather than having full-time employees. And if you look at the, the aspect of somebody like Airbnb with 160 staff mm -hmm. versus Hyatt hotels who have 45,000 staff, right? Those, those metrics are beginning to come in and take a place. So if we need a higher quality, more trained more qualified level of salesperson. How are we going to get those with the decreasing in investment employees that we're seeing today? That's that's a great question. Uh, there's really uh, the only thing that's being done out there uh, outside the profession that's at the university level is uh, some universities have started to have some programs where they actually get you can actually get a degree in sales now. Something when yeah. I went to university didn't exist. Um, England has, and, and I forget the guy's name, but a couple years ago a member of par parliament started to get involved with the ISMM and they recognized that there was more money being spent on training hairdressers in England than there was on training salespeople. You, do know, why, you know why that is, don't you? They did a survey, um, in actual fact, hairdressers are more respected than salespeople in the UK. 
Well, that's probably globally, <laughs> <laughs> um, which is another problem that we have as a, as a profession that we need to change. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, and I think that all ties into the professionalism. And, and as sales becomes more professional, and salespeople become more professional, then uh, I think that will change. And um, but what this uh, initiative in the UK has done is there's actually now a certification program that yep. I've seen, um, and I, I think that's a great thing. And I think it's something that uh, could and should come here uh, or throughout the throughout the world. Um, one other thing to mention, you, you mentioned Airbnb and yes they have a very small staff but uh, I was at a uh, convention last year here in Austria and they were talking about e-commerce and mm -hmm. how you know there was a comment about how we don't really need salespeople because everyone's buying through things through the internet and they showed the top I think it was 10 e-commerce companies in Austria and they all had four or five out of five stars for everything but customer service, where they all had one to three stars. I think one had three stars, the rest had one or two stars. And if you talk to people, you know, they want, even when they're buying things online, they want to be able to reach out and talk to somebody and get advice when they need it. And that's a salesperson. Absolutely. And that is a salesperson too. So we need to think maybe as a profession also expand our thinking of who is a salesperson because it's not just the person who puts on the suit and tie and goes into an office and makes a sale or the door-to-door -door salesman or the car salesman. It's, it's literally everyone who is trying to help the customer satisfy a need and be happy with what they purchase. Absolutely. I think it's all about the customer experience at the, the end of the day and that begins with marketing effectively, continues into the salesperson and into the uh, customer service staff. And exactly. each of those people are effectively selling at, at some point in some way. Right. Um, it's just we, d we don't quite get it these days. Just for the viewers, the ISMM in the UK is the Institute of Sales and Marketing Management, which is a great foundation to help encourage professionalism within the UK. Uh, there are other institutions available, such as the Chartered Institute of Marketing, which also do qualifications for salespeople. It's also worth mentioning the University of Portsmouth now does yes. a MBA effectively in sales management, which is, uh, I think, Neil Rackham is actually one of the, uh, the key speakers on that course. He is, and so is um, Beth Rogers. Absolutely, love Beth, give, yep. Give somebody a plug from there, so. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so let's move on to question three. So this ties in very nicely into the, the last question. How important is knowledge transfer and the role of sales managers in sustaining change? Uh, it's vital. Uh, let's face it. You know, in, in the end, uh, it's it's beautiful here. It's um, I don't know, 20, 25 degrees Celsius, blue skies, slight uh, breeze in the air, and I'd much rather be sitting outside on my porch right now. Yeah, I'm human, and we all we all are. So when Salespeople are out there working, the average salesperson, the average person working anywhere, they're going to do their job and they're going to do their job well, but they don't like change. It's human nature. Yeah. So, you know, if you can show them the reason and a path and support them and help them, the average person also will embrace change. So if it's the sales managers, especially the frontline sales managers, who are the ones that can do this. And if we empower them, with the right culture in the organization, the right tools to get in front of their salespeople and say, look, let's let's go make a difference. Let's get a little bit better today, a little bit better tomorrow. Let's have fun doing it, and let's make a difference for our customers. The average salesperson will buy in and jump up and down and say, great, let's do it. So uh, they're vital in my mind. Mm. Yeah, I think so as well. If you if the sales coaching isn't in place for the sell, well, the transition from sales manager into sales coach, and if they're not coaching their team, then I think that's a very difficult position to put the sales individuals in, yep. because they're not going to change because they don't see other people changing. No, why should they? Why should Absolutely. they give something effort, some extra effort when somebody else isn't? Yep. So. When I'm when I'm always talking about when I'm talking about CRM and selling it to somebody, they always bring up user adoption. And I always use the adage: people aren't resistant to change; they're just just resistant to change by other people. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. they do change. You change all the time. You buy a new house. You move location. You change your car. You change. Yeah. It's a natural progression in life. But being forced to change is where the uh, resistance comes from. So you yeah. have to make it natural you have to make it a progression for people exactly. and if you can make it a change organization so it's they're used to growing as individuals then I think that makes that whole progression much much easier right and that's why I keep starting off with the C-level people 
because they yep. have to set, they have to lead by example. They have to buy into it first. Yeah, yep. that's a tough call that one. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> so Barbara said here, when do you expect the stigma attached to sales to to blow over? Uh, I'd love to say in my lifetime. Unfortunately, I think it's going to take a lot longer. You know. Uh, I, I teach part-time, I lecture part-time at a couple universities that have some sales courses and uh, I try to explain this uh, by using the use the car or the car salesman example and I say look you go into a car dealer and they try to sell you whatever it is that uh, they want to sell and you could you could put in anybody you can go to any retail any B2B it doesn't matter if a salesperson tries to sell you what they want to sell you maybe you buy it maybe you don't maybe they sell five units this month but that's all they're going to sell. If they really help that customer and that customer really likes it, and going back to the car example because you buy a new car every three to five years, you sell five a month for the first three years, maybe even after the first year you might be selling six or seven a month because your customers are actually referring you. And you're building up in the second year you sell seven a month, third year maybe you're selling eight a month, but in that fourth year when those first customers came back that really liked you, Four out of the five come back, and you went from eight to twelve a month. Yeah. And uh, so I, I roll this out over the course of a twenty-year period for them, and you know they see all of a sudden the power of treating customers right. And when we do that, and when people who have a leadership position in the industry or in the sales profession uh, are able to get out there in front of uh, let's let's call it the camera in front of people and say, look, we're, we're changing. Mm. You know, um, things like developing a, a global ethics code for sales I think would be a great idea. I know it's happened in different countries, I know different associations have them, uh, but nobody's gotten behind the global one. So I think when these things happen, I think we'll start to be able to change the way sales is perceived. I think it's absolutely correct and I think that Again, I think it comes down to leadership because ultimately, mm -hmm. at some point in time, you know, a, every salesperson will come across a bad deal and they will sell it because yeah. they need the revenue that month. And the leadership needs to turn around and say, "That's a bad sale. Don't do it again." But they yep. don't. What typically happens is leadership turn around and say, "You've got X goal this month. Your quota is this. We need that money. Go yep. get it. I don't care how you get it." Exactly. Exactly. And then you've got the culture of doesn't care, matter how you sell. I have a family to feed. I got to keep my job. Yeah, exactly. So, so it's, I, I see it as much a leadership as an issue as the individual salespeople. Um, sure. And until we change the leadership again, back to the C team, um, you're not going to turn around and alter that stigma which is attached to the salespeople, unfortunately. No, you're right. And it is that C team that can get in front of the cameras and create institutes or come up with a global ethics. Uh, policy for sales. So you're right, it is them. It's not the average salesperson on the street. Mm. They can do their part, but to make the big difference. Yeah, yeah it's got to come from the top. Exactly. It becomes culture then. Mm -hmm. What are some of the options for sales executives when it comes to employment skill level within their company? Uh, well, as I see it, I think there's probably four. Uh, really, one thing they could do is they can stay the course, right? That's always the answer. Stay the course, don't change anything, keep doing what we're doing. And uh, given that we all know the success rates of sales training long term, i.e. more than 90 or 120 days, uh, that's not a great option, but unfortunately that's the one most companies are choosing. Uh, another one that companies can do is uh, lower the standard. If we have lower standards, then you know we're more likely to meet our sales uh, development goal or our sales ability goals, let's say. And uh, by default, this is also something I think too many companies are doing because they have openings and they need to fill them with bodies and quite often they don't ask, is this the best person for the job or is this person just right for the job is what they usually ask. You know, am I, can I be happy with this person in the job? Not, is this the best person I can find and should I leave the job open a little longer? Because somebody has to run that territory. You know, there's the chance yep. of losing customers. So uh, I think too often, especially frontline sales managers are uh, threatened with, you know, get somebody in there, I'm going to pull your slot. I'm going to reduce your headcount. Yeah. And, and you throw somebody in there. You know, it happens. I've had it happen to me. Because somebody's uh, better than nobody. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the other new thing, and we've talked about a little bit with uh, university programs now, is hire sales graduates. 
You know, the Sales Education Foundation is out there and they have some statistics, but uh, there are university graduates available now that have gone through school, a university, gotten a degree in mark, uh, bachelor's or master's in sales, and in the U.S. there's a lot of sales competitions. I mean, they're, they're local, regional, national. They're great sales competitions. Um, I've had students participate at the Northern Illinois University one um, a few years ago while they were still accepting international students in that competition. And uh, I know that there's one that's been started here in Europe uh, that's gotten actually some funding from the government to start up. And they're, it's uh, kind of a closed competition this year as a test run. And the next year, they're going to be passing it out um, to, I, I don't know how far. Um, and I know, like Beth Rogers, I know she tries to participate. Her students were involved in NIU uh, a couple years ago. So I think hiring sales graduates is definitely a way companies can get a head start with getting good qualified salespeople. And the last one that I would say, actually, uh, to go with the topic of uh, making smarter decisions and stop wasting money of the of today, stop sales training. Stop sales Just training. Stop sales, sales training. training. Companies need to take a breath. Stop sales training. Stop checking the box and figure out what they're doing. Once they can figure out why they're doing the sales training, how they're going to be able to coach their people after the sales training, do they have success behaviors, characteristics that are developed with HR that are tied to coaching reports, that are tied to performance evaluations? The answer usually is, yeah, but um, kind of. <laughs> yeah, they're there somewhere. Um, and that's almost always the answer if they're there. So, you know, really, companies would be wiser to cut down on sales training, save one of those few billion dollars or euros a year that are spent on sales training around the world, and put some of the other things in place, starting, again, back to the C-level, making sure that they have everything in place. Maybe putting in place something like a sales management development program where you can actually develop future sales managers before they are thrown into the position so they know how to be coaches. <laughs> Now, that would be controversial. I, I know, I know, I know. It's amazing if you talk to a company and uh, you know, the first thing is, oh, that would be a huge investment. Well, it's a smarter investment than continuing to throw money away doing sales training. Yeah. I think, um, I, I don't, don't think it's uh, age-related or anything like that. I think it's, um, it, it's a mindset change, effectively. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, that does start at the top. And the problem with sales training is, Quite often, I've seen it implemented as a tick box. We need to provide our salespeople with some training. We've got this HR training budget, so therefore we'll just do two days of or three days of challenger sales, solution yep. sales, or whatever the sales training happens to be at that particular moment. Exactly. It's part of the corporate sales get together once once a year. And <laughs> let's face it, uh, most of the sales guys and ladies have probably had a few too many champagne glasses and. Uh, it's yeah. not the best environment for conducive and conductive learning. I think no. it's, uh, yeah, so I, I think it comes back to that word strategy. And you have a strategy to educate, to up the skill level and qualifications of your sales team so they become more competent and more professional. Exactly. That doesn't happen with a single training event and doing one-off sales training. No. doesn't work. It, do, it doesn't. And, uh, you know, so I know there's some training companies that have tried to start to develop sales academies and work with companies to do something long term. Um, but again, they're basing it off of the sales training company's own material. Yep. And uh, not really customizing things for their client, which doesn't help either, because if you don't customize it, you, you can't really match what the, com your, yep. what the customer's strategy is and what they see on a daily basis. It's like all content needs so, to be relevant. Yep. Absolutely. Exactly. I completely yeah. agree with that. I think it's more than just the customization of the content, although that is obviously a huge step. It's reinforcing yeah. that training as you as you go through. And I think that's something that we've mentioned before in this show is there are a, a whole host of apps that you can get out there which can help to reinforce the training as you go along. And most of the time, organizations just don't do that. Uh, it could be yeah. as simple as using something like um, Flip. Flipboard is good for that as a magazine, effectively. You can build one for your own internal people at zero cost, effectively. Right. Um, or you can use something like Showpad, which is fantastic for that whole uh, sales enablement engagement levels as well. Exactly. The, the more things you do to tie, the, after, to tie in events after the training back to the training, the better off you're going to be. Exactly. 
Absolutely. I think that's completely correct. Okay, let's move on to question five. What are the common reasons sales training fails? I think we've covered some of that. <laughs> I, I did, and you know what? I, I was... Yeah, I would love to hear some other reasons. If, if anybody can tweet reasons, you know, we, we know the sales company was bad, that um, the reps didn't want to do it. We know, we know those common reasons, but we've also talked about the reasons from the C level. So if anybody else has others we haven't talked about, I, I'd love to see them tweeted and uh, read about them. So yeah. you mentioned before about the customization of content, and Bob's just come back and said, yeah, she's seen that as well, that people don't customize the content. Uh, the only thought that springs to mind is if you're turning around and delivering something such as spin selling, which is, you know, it's a trademark, a challenger, which is a trademark, et cetera, yeah. and all these different methodologies, don't they have to be delivered in a specific format using specific materials for it to be a certified training course? It does. And if you want a method, then you better hope that all your customers or you better go find customers that want to be sold by that method for your product for this day. There's hundreds of methods out there. Um, I, I actually had a student uh, do her thesis on this uh, a year ago, and I said, go out there and just figure out how many methods there are first. And she came back with well over 100. Um, that she found quite easily in a couple of days. So, you know, these methods are good. They're nice tools, but I would call them simply tools. And uh, yeah. you, know, you need to have a lot of tools in your toolbox to be able to handle any customer in any given day for any given situation. So, um, Absolutely. I think... Um, I think that's completely true. And I think Bob's just come up with the point again that most good trainers build in pre, during, and post training. And Mick Adams has also said that the lack of application after they walk out the training room is a, is a huge issue as well. I think that all comes down to me. I think we're all singing from the same hymn sheet here is that it, there needs to be a strategy. It's not just an in class event, there's a whole learning. Uh, agenda which needs to take place, which takes into account the fact that it's not just one day sat in a classroom or a couple of hours of video that you're you're forced to watch over lunch, etc. Exactly. Yep. Exactly. And you know the the tests afterwards or things like this are great. They're nice, uh, but also let's be a little realistic. Uh, you're going to have two or three of your salespeople coming together to make sure they pass the test. Uh, <laughs> I would never no. do that in my life. I, never, never. I have never, ever, ever. Particularly with <laughs> online courses, I've never Skyped somebody so, in so they could see my screen. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, um, you know, we, we, management also has to be smart on how they do these. And that comes back to why the sales manager, the frontline sales manager, is the key. Yeah, I think you've got to have realistic yeah. examples of how it works within your organization. Yeah. Four scenarios which are built around real life situations your company has come across. Yeah. I think otherwise it's very hard to translate it into, because it's so easy, and particularly with salespeople, because they, they can be very pessimistic at times to turn around <laughs> and say, well, that's not the way my customers behave. My customer would never say that. If you can use some of their examples, right? brilliant. I think that's a exactly. fantastic way of doing it. Exactly. Good. Right, so moving to question six. How can companies benefit from hiring graduates who earned a university degree in sales? Well, uh, that's a great question. And I've tried to find more and more statistics on this. Unfortunately, there aren't that many statistics. There's, it's relatively it's, new. So, yeah. It is. It's relatively new. Um, so going back to the Sales Education Foundation in the U.S., uh, they've done a couple studies, one showing that there is a 50% uh, decrease in ramp up time. Wow. Um, and, yep. And a 30% decrease in turnover by hiring sales graduates. That's so interesting. When you yeah, when you think about the average sales rep to hire a sales rep and train them costs one year's salary plus benefits, taxes, everything, the the cost savings right there is astronomical. Yep. So uh, and I would love to see these studies uh, compared in other places and duplicated to confirm them. Yeah. What about, is there any statistics on marketing as a degree where they've, because of course marketing as a degree has been around for a long time <laughs> and then marketing get it, you know, that's a reality. They know about the degree courses, they know about investment and skill set, etc. It just seems to be that sales just, you know, we don't really want to do it because it's too much, is it too much like hard work or is it too much like, well, you can compare us and we're already being compared on revenue anyway, we don't need another thing to have to worry about. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think it's um, part of it's that. I think it's also just that uh, most salespeople, quite honestly, want to be left alone to do their job. They like people. They like working in teams. They don't want to be sitting in an office. They don't want to be somebody over their shoulder all the time, um, watching them, anything like that. So uh, I, I think that's a big part of it. Is just salespeople in general want to be left alone. And marketers, yeah, they get it. They they go through uh, degrees. Every, almost every university has a marketing degree out there. And um, yeah, I don't know if I've, to answer your question, I don't know if I've uh, really seen any statistics, although I must say I haven't really dug for these statistics because uh, there is also still that problem, even though it's been talked about now. I think the first Harvard Business Review article was over 20 years ago about bridging marketing and sales, you know, aligning marketing and sales, um, but it's still not happening. So uh, in terms of that, I try to stay away from it. Um, and so I don't go looking for it, I guess I should say. What I do try to do, though, is talk to marketing and to salespeople and say, you know, it, customers are changing. Buyers are getting more information from marketing sources. Customers now are, what, 70% of the way through their purchase decision. So it's harder for salespeople, once they start talking to a customer, to steer them in a better direction. And so the marketing material has to stop being product focused and be more solutions and benefit focused, especially as customers move further down the buying process and cover that gap from about 40% to 70% that used to be where the, where the customers would switch over to the salespeople. Yep, so. I think that 70% is a really interesting um, stat. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the statistic isn't... It depends on the type of industry you're in, because if you're in B2C, that's very, very relevant. It's yeah. less relevant in a B2B, although the numbers are still increasingly and are higher, 57%, et cetera. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> the devil is always in the detail with these percentages. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, for me, we, we often talk about that's the fact that marketing now need to engage from a much broader spectrum. Uh, I, I, I personally don't buy into that, because I, I think that, just means the salesperson can't sit back and wait for the prospect to engage with them. They've got to be more forthcoming and yes. outbound to turn around and make sure that they are available, uh, visible to be to be talked to. And if you if we then come back to the whole the whole social selling aspect of always be helping. That's very relevant to the new selling style. And if you think about the older selling style of what was called consultative selling or what mm -hmm. solution selling originally was as well, right. rather than just packaging everything together, <laughs> then, uh, then it's about you know, making sure you can provide good advice and become a trusted advisor for people. So I think there is that natural progression. The terminology is changing slightly. Right. But I think that buyer pattern change is, is a tremendous thing and making, making good salespeople rare, not rarer necessarily, but stand out more mm -hmm. and actually you're realizing the difference between a good salesperson and somebody who can just box shift the transactional salesperson. Exactly. I 100% I agree and really for this to be able to happen, you know, IBM's a good example of what they did years ago, right? 400% uh, increase, yeah. Yep. So, but for this to happen, it's not the salesperson, it's not that good standout salesperson. It is the C-level, the executives. Yep. And then going right. down and making sure the processes are there, and then marketing has to provide the salespeople with the right messaging. Yeah, and the right messaging as in sales messaging, not the right message as in marketing messaging. And work with the salespeople to make sure that they can properly go out there and do social selling. Uh, otherwise, the, your good salespeople are going to leave. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's true. But in Vienna, we have um, the University of Applied Science. I think you know that, um, I'm Chris. And yes. um, the, this university offers um, um, the study sales and marketing as one thing. What do you think about this um, kind of study? OK. Uh, I think that all salespeople need marketing courses. Yep. OK. Um, I think all marketing people need sales courses. Mm -hmm. What I am finding when we have these marketing and sales programs, and where I lecture one of those programs is a marketing and sales degree. Uh, there's about four and a half sales courses for the bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. That's it. So um, at best, more, normally it's two sales courses. 
um, some kind of basic selling skills, or applied selling skills, key account management, and then some kind of sales management. But maybe um, you're doing that during the master's degrees. I mean, I yeah. I don't know really the the program, so yeah, I it's have no idea. yeah the master is kind of the same thing uh, from what I'm seeing is the master's degree has a couple of courses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm uh, an alumni from the Executive Academy of the Business University, Business Economics University, the Virchow University, and I spoke with the head of their sales and marketing program, and they offer the same degree. But mm -hmm. again, there's a couple of sales courses, and the okay. rest is really marketing, and they bring outside people in to do the sales. None of the professors are doing the sales. So I do think there's good universities out there. I think you have to look at what's really being taught, what courses there are, and find out is it really a marketing and sales program, or is it an equal program, or is it more of a sales program? Um, the uh, lower uh, or uh, upper Austria has mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a great program that's B two B sales also, and it's amazing. Austria, uh, we have what seven seven and a half million people, and there's probably more marketing and sales programs in Austria than any other country <laughs> per capita. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but you just need to look at what's in the program. But that that goes for any program. You know, even if it's a sales only degree, you then got to look at it and see is it a technology sales degree, a B two B consumer and, and see what's in there to see if it's where you want to go. Yeah. I mean, but then it's, I think it's it's so hard then to hire um, a sales guy, for example, if in the CV there is mentioned he has a master degree in sales and marketing. I mean, how can um, a leader um, make sure that, um, yeah, this is the right person for that job? I mean, uh, management has not the time <laughs> to go through the program and you know what I mean? Exactly. So, you know, and even if somebody goes through a program, it's still the individual. I mean, let's, let's face it, 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 people can get through programs. Um, you know, my freshman year, I had a lot of fun at university before I figured out what I was doing there. So, um, <laughs> the, the other years were much better, but, you know, so people, though, get through. And so you got to find out. And whether they have had high academic success or average academic success, in the end, that doesn't necessarily give an indication of if somebody's going to be successful. Um, what really matters is uh, what is that person doing with the tools that they learned, and what kind of will does that person, willpower does that person have inside that when they're on the job, that they're going to do the job right, and they're always going to try to get better. And that takes, quite honestly, that takes interviewing. That's one reason why I love sales competitions at universities, because you get to see how people will perform in stress situations in front of customers versus going out on the first uh, field ride or sales calls as the manager with your salesperson after they've gone through weeks <laughs> of training, and uh, all of a sudden the salesperson is just kind of like, um, hmm, what am I going to make up to tell you? Because I don't remember what to say, and my boss is standing next to me. So, you know, it, it, takes, some, it takes work, and that's, that's a skill in to itself, and that goes back to uh, yet another point on supporting training potential future sales managers before they're in that role. You know, hiring is just a small subset of that, that where a lot of money is wasted. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. so what we're going to so let's turn around and think about the university degree. I've turned around, I've got my degree in sales. I've okay. gone to I've gone to my school. I've then gone from one school to college. I've got my next qualification, paper qualification. I'm then going to go and do my degree to get my next paper qualification again. And I've got it in sales. So now I'm a certified salesperson. Probably certifiable as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> There's a, there's a whole lack of experience that's just in that paper trail we've done. And I've seen people do it who've got MBAs, who they've just gone degree, postgraduate, etc. Without that real world experience to back it up, it becomes very limited. Right. And isn't there a danger that we now turn around and start saying, well, we'll hire degree educated salespeople only because therefore we don't need to train them? That would be a danger, but that's not going to happen with 105. Uh, sales degrees, uh, according to the Sales Education Foundation, uh, throughout the U.S. and Europe out of over 8,000 universities. <laughs> so that, that's just not going to happen. But your point's well taken. It doesn't matter, you know, somebody gets a marketing degree, but they want to go into sales, or, um, you know, most college students say sales, I'm never going into sales. Forget it. You know, but yet, right. one in six jobs in most countries are a sales job or a sales-related job. So. 
people by default end up in sales. So um, regardless of what their degree is, yes, you got to be able to figure out and see can this person actually apply and do some some of the job. You know, can they take the book smarts and get the old fashioned street smarts to go with it? So yeah, I think that's good. Okay, let's move on to question seven. Okay. Uh, Describe a successful process to get to sales training return on investment. So we've mentioned that classroom training isn't very, in isolation, doesn't work that well. Yeah. Um, I think to some degree as well, um, a degree level sales certification by itself also isn't necessarily that fantastic. Right. You need to have the return on investment. You need to have the experience. So how are we going to turn around and make sure that the sales training, no matter where it came from, is going to give us a return on investment and particularly when you look at let's say an MBA in sales is going to cost you anywhere between 20 and 40,000 euros mm -hmm. uh, well. at least. <laughs> yeah. plus the lost wages of uh, yeah exactly so, so what's the return on investment how do you so, ensure that you're actually going to get that one as an organization and two if you're going to have yeah. to start education how, how are you going to get that as well yeah uh, to me really it, it's not easy and companies need to, to really just suck it up Bite the bullet, uh, to use some phrases from the states, and uh, and and make the tough decisions and start to put together a long-term process to support their strategy. And first thing I would say, and we've already said this, is C-level commitment. Without yeah. a doubt, it's got to start there. And that's another thing I saw this McKinsey study. I just quickly read through it this morning, and uh, a very high number, something like two-thirds of uh, companies polled said that or surveyed said that development was one of their key strategies. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's got to happen. It's got to start with the C level and they can't just put it into a strategy and walk away. You know, it's uh, the same thing with s uh, consultants, the consultant sales on any kind of strategy. They may write a great strategy. They hand it over to the CEO. The CEO says, great, here you go, vice president, implement it. And the vice president sit there and say, oh boy, well, let me see what I can start passing out down the chain, and eventually it just gets watered down and not done. So starting with the C-level. From there, they have got to develop the leadership, coaching, and development culture, and it has to start with them. Uh, and they have to reinforce it. Literally, they have to become coaches to their senior vice presidents, or the CEO to the C-level people, each of them to their senior vice presidents, and on down the line. It should be treated right out down so that every manager is out there coaching their people. Uh, in sales more so than probably any other industry because in sales you're performing. You know, whether you're an athlete or actor, you're performing in front of the customer. And unless you can have out-of-body experiences, you're not going to walk away from a 15-minute conversation and know what you said and what you did. And people pick up bad habits. And uh, so you need that coach. And, uh, you know, so that needs to start at the C-level, coaching his people and all the way down. From there, companies need to bridge uh, their strategies and their sales execution together. Spe talking specifically about sales, but within any part, you mm -hmm. need to bridge that strategy all the way down to sales. That has to happen. Okay. And so also let's, vertically. Go ahead. You've got the strategy, you're applying it down. So yeah. the only way to ensure that's going to be uh, achieved is to turn around and measure that. So, question eight. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what metrics are the most important ones to monitor? to help improve sales performance? Uh, actually, I don't know if there is one particular um, number or anything you should look at to monitor performance because that depends on the company. You know, same, same thing we were talking about earlier about um, canned sales training is no good if you don't customize it for the company. Every company and even every individual sales force within a company has different metri metrics that are going to show whether they're doing a good job or not. But uh, So what I would say is you've got to break it down into two things, quantitative and qualitative. And on the quantitative side, we have to get away from looking at object objectives as measurements that you can actually use to track, evaluate, and improve sales performance. Objectives, um, you know, raising your quota by 10% or uh, achieving an increase of 3% market share. A salesperson, no individual has control over that. None. Yeah. You can only influence it. Um, where they have control are activities. You know, if they have to increase market share, are they calling on the right customers to do it? Are they making, uh, for those customers they need to call on, are they completing 100% pre-call plans? 
or are they just walking in there hoping they remember off the top of their head what was uh, said before? And so you've really got to look at what activities did this, the, each individual company needs, each individual sales force within the company needs to meet their numbers and improve their performance. Um, and uh, to give another um, uh, person out there who has put this together in a very nice book, which Neil Rockman uh, wrote the foreword for, is uh, Jason Jordan in Cracking the Sales Management Code. Absolutely and he correct. explains this very well. Yeah. So that's one half. The other half is qual uh, qualitative because you need to have success behavior, success characteristics that show a salesperson how to do the job right and how to be successful. And some of those are ethics, some of those are uh, how you start off a conversation with a customer based on the company's goals and the company's culture and the company's strategies. And the only way you're going to be able to monitor and measure these are with the sales manager being in front of them. And to give a, a pure example that I dealt with, three-day sales training on the rollout of a new product, uh, 8,000 salespeople brought in nationwide, a lot of money spent, I'm in the field with the sales rep the next week, the customer throws an objection out, sales rep actually ignores it, doesn't even <laughs> acknowledge it, um, an experienced sales rep, so we get outside, good coach, I don't say anything, yep. I bite my lip and let it happen, walk outside, get in the car, drive down the street, pull into the coffee shop, uh, order, and I say, okay, so why didn't you answer the objection? <laughs> well, I didn't know what to say. So qualitatively, it, it wasn't there. So yeah. you got to do both. got to do both. Excellent. That's a great answer. I think, uh, I think that's, um, yeah, when you, you think, I think the, uh, the sales manager's handbook, I think that turns around and says, the av it's a bit like the average, the average time spent reviewing with a salesperson is like three minutes per month. It's like terrible numbers. It, uh, I ridiculous. think that might be per opportunity in your pipeline, but it's, uh, it's the same principle if you think about it. It's just a lack of uh, current attention. I guess is one of the problems we've got there with the sales managers or sales coaches, the fact that they only, they're only they carrying as well, so they have to turn around and chase their own deals. So they've got this split role of having to chase deals as well as having to look after the staff. And when it ultimately comes down to it, as most in the sales pay people, and of course it's what the business needs, it's all about the revenue, not about the management element of it. I 100% agree when you have a culture starting with the C-level that supports that and you put in sales managers who were great sales reps who never got trained in how to be not only managers but also coaches. Yep. And um, so yeah, unfortunately that still exists and we, we need to change it. And I have, <coughs> excuse me, a personal example where I took over a sales team that was dead last in the country, two years, or bottom 10%. So basically dead last two years in a row. Luckily, not only did I change as the manager, but also the person that would be my manager changed at the same time, brought in a new culture of, of wanting the managers to coach their salespeople. And in six months, we were in the top 10%. And one of the people that literally was still on a performance improvement plan that was going to be fired if the managers hadn't changed that month was in the running for the President's Club in the organization top 3%. Wow. That, so, that shows you that it can be just organizational. Uh, yes, definitely. Having said that, um, John Golden, uh, our CSO, he turned sure. around to me and told me a story, which uh, I'm sure we forgot quite time for. Um, <laughs> it, he, he mentioned one of his sales guys was that he was managing, he was inside a sales guy. Uh, they were turning around and he was about to be fired for not making quota uh, for three quarters in a row. Yep. Fair enough, everybody knew it was going to happen, worst performing person, etc. And uh, all the other guys went out to lunch. They left him as the guy manning the phones because it didn't really matter on a lunchtime and he was always the one that got picked on effectively. Yep. So he picks up the phone to a call and a customer calls, a prospect calls in and orders 200 licenses of their <laughs> particular methodology that he was dealing with. Yep. At that point in time, he goes from being the worst performing salesperson for over six months so to the sad. highest performing because it was worth nearly yeah. $2 million. Exactly. And made um, President's Club and made President's Club off the renewals for the next three years running and they couldn't get rid of him. They had to keep him for that one deal because the guy liked him. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's why I say quantitative, qualitative measures. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, the other thing I would say is sales managers 
have to look in front of the mirror before it comes time to fire somebody for performance and say, have I, as their manager, done everything I can to help them improve, or is it that they simply don't have the will to improve? Absolutely. If you can, if you can answer that, have a clear conscience and pull the trigger and get rid of them. Yeah, is it a failure of you as a manager or coach, or is it the exactly. failure of the individual person? And I don't think it's ever a straightforward conversation. I don't think it's ever just one element, or rarely, should we say. I think there's always a, you know, it can be just they're not a good fit for your team. That's true, too. Yep, exactly. Right, let's move on to question 10. I'm going to skip okay. question 9 because we've kind of answered that already. <laughs> uh, share with us one real-world sales training success story from a leading brand. I would actually love to, but since <clears throat> I believe you can't just measure success on sales training or performance only on revenue numbers, because we don't have control over revenue, I'm not sure which one that would be. So first of all, if anybody out there listening knows of one where you can actually show quantitatively and qualitatively where de skills were developed, performance was increased, not for 60 or 90 days, but for 6 months, 12 months, 18 months, long term, I'd love to see it. Um, a good example is a project that I worked on uh, two years, half a million euros worth, sitting down with the uh, head of L&D of the country, and uh, she said, well, we think that this project's been a failure because we haven't had a 20% increase in our sales over the last year. And I said, okay, where were you? She goes, well, we're indexed at 100. And I said, interesting. I just saw in the news the other week that uh, your industry in this country is down 79% this year. So mm -hmm. have we really been a failure? Um, same company, same conversation. I said, I think we need to have our last training or our last meeting, seminars, be with the national sales manager who hasn't been through the training and the three national sales managers for the categories of the people that we were training. So we get them and a bunch of other people in the room, and two out of those four national sales managers representing 60% of this company's revenue potential, two of them said, we didn't even know you were in our, in our uh, locations for the last two years doing the training. <laughs> so if anybody knows of any real examples, I would consider that training a success overall, but I would also consider it a failure because it depended on the culture of the management teams locally because they weren't getting it from a national level. Yeah, I guess that's true, isn't it? And then that comes back to having a strategy for the sales training. Rather than treating it in isolation, you've got to turn around and have that strategy. Or it doesn't matter what you do, it's always going to be a failure. Yeah. Because you haven't got the uh, the organizational framework in place to be able to support it going forward. Exactly. And, and I know there's tr sales trainers out there and, and companies, consulting companies, that say, yes, we on average increase uh, companies' revenues by 37%. But how do you narrow it down to them? You can't. There's too many variables in sales to narrow it down to the fact that somebody went through training or they got a new strategy or anything else. There's just too many variables. So you've got to look at quantitative and qualitative to figure it out. Okay, so that's great. Understand that. But we need, we need to have measures because we have accountants in the room. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so I actually how are we, like How are we going to do it? Yeah. Um, yeah, my and best friend so actually in the in account, account, so. <laughs> revenue, which is obviously the the rev revenue is the typical measure because it's the only direct output effectively. Right. What else can we measure it off? Well, I think there's some great things like uh, you know percent of uh, opportunities won that yep. can start to give you an idea. You know the ability to move opportunities through uh, the pipe pipeline, uh, the ability specific activities where you're focusing your time on the right customers, because if you're focusing your time on the right customers according to the company's strategy, and you have the right development, and there's the company's giving you the right tools, and you're not making quota, then it's not you, it's something else. Maybe it's the quota, maybe it's uh, the strategy's wrong, it, there's a thousand things it could be, so I'm not trying to point fingers anywhere, but we need to look at all these different factors, pick the ones that are most relevant for that company and that company's strategy, and then go from there. Because in my opinion, revenue is not a good number anymore. Because every single salesperson wants to give a discount. Nobody can sell anything without a discount. I had a company I was training. They said their products were the best. And I said, okay, and how often do you sell with the discount? And they said, well, not always, but a fair amount of the time. Okay. Um, so why do you have to always give discounts? Well, because our customers want the lowest price. And I said, are you the lowest price? No. 
do you have any business? Yes. <laughs> so it's not about price. So you know, we got a company CEO has to put down not only the value proposition to the customer, but they have to explain it internally and make sure it's aligned internally first, mm. so the salespeople know what to do. So finding that right measure, it's got to be customized for that company and even that sales team within the company. Okay. So if you take it from that perspective, what I'm hearing is that you need a holistic approach across the entire organization to make sure that everybody's lined up, they know what they're talking about from a strategic point of view, so they can actually turn around and present the real value to, to the potential prospect and to the customers. And it exactly. doesn't matter who they speak to, whether it's sales, marketing, customer service, you're all able to do that. You're all able to do that. You're all able to customize it then for the customer, whether the customer is the purchasing manager, the finance person, the shop floor manager, the um, person who has to deal with the inventory sitting in the warehouse. They all have different answers that they need to hear. Absolutely. Exactly. Fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you very much. That does bring us to a close on Hash Sales EU. Uh, your Twitter account again is at Leader for Sales, and it's Visionaires, so Vision, W E R S, partner.com. Correct. Uh, Richard, thank you and Martha, and thanks everyone for uh, the tweets the last few days. I do greatly appreciate those too, everyone out there. You're thanks. most welcome. Thank you for your time. It's been great. Thank you. Bye-bye.